I mean, you know, 9/11 happened because of Bill Clinton's mistake in allowing the Taliban to take control of Afghanistan. Clinton is, in a sense, responsible ultimately for 9/11, although nobody really understands. The Taliban came back to power with American money. This is a serial history of American mistakes in Afghanistan. The Taliban. A civil war is going on. This civil war is being fought by China and by Pakistan. I think Joe Biden finally is beginning to understand that he made a huge mistake following in the footsteps of Donald Trump. But China and Pakistan are going to work to try and strengthen the Taliban, and other countries have to defeat that because the Taliban is bad news. Bring the Taliban together with the Afghan national government. They are antithetical to each other. It is not possible. I like to say there is no doubt the Chinese want the Taliban to come to power. They are with the Pakistan military, and Pakistan military is with the Taliban. They are still sitting on the wall uh, of so-called balance between powers when the whole world is separating with Cold War 2.0. Afghanistan is on the threshold again with the US troops withdrawing from the country. The Taliban is gaining weight with each passing day and a civil war looms in the country which will affect the entire region. So to discuss the emerging scenarios and India's role in the same, today we have a very distinguished guest, Professor M.D. Nalavat. Professor Madhav Das Nalavat is Director of Geopolitics and International Relations and UNESCO Peace Chair at Manipal University. He is also the editorial director of the Sunday Guardian and ITV Network. And he is also Vice Chair of Manipal University's Advanced Research Group. He has been editor of the Times of India and editor of Matibuni. Dr. Nalapats writes expertly on international affairs and appears regularly in global media as a respected authority on geopolitics. I welcome Professor M.D. Nalapats. Uh, good evening, Professor. I'll start with a question which is there on everybody's mind. Will the Taliban take over Afghanistan? In such a scenario, how should the world deal with the Taliban or whatever happening in Pakistan? Probably, we think that it's an emerging scenario. Uh, Prashant, Afghanistan has been a tortured country for a very long time. And if I may say so, the reason for that is, first of all, in the 1970s, the Soviet Union got involved and especially even in the 1960s and tried to basically make that country almost part of the Soviet Union as its, uh, you know, uh, as its base in South Asia. Well, the fact, and of course, even before that, you got the great game. So the reality is that in, in, you know, in 1979, uh, Leonid Brezhnev made the big mistake of invading and occupying Afghanistan when his proxies failed to establish control over the country. And unfortunately, what happened, President Carter, as well as his successor, President Reagan, made the big mistake of outsourcing the conflict against the Soviet Union and its occupation of Afghanistan to the Pakistan military and the Pakistan state, which were run by the same person, General Ziaul Haq. You know, Ziaul Haq was a Wahhabi, a fanatic Wahhabi. And he is, he is the person who began the empowerment of the Wahhabis in Pakistan and finally was able to succeed in putting the Pakistan military on course to be a Wahhabi a military, a Wahhabi force, which unfortunately it has been for, the, for, 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 for some decades now, even after Zia. So this mistake was made, and as a consequence, what happened? Zia ensured that the American assistance was funneled through Pakistan, and which basically meant it went only to the custom religious extremists, religious supremacists, and and fanatics. And this was a small minority of the Pashtun population. Moderates were overwhelmingly uh, represented in the Pashtun community. These were ignored, and the fanatics were empowered by Ziaul Haq. And as a consequence, 
uh, Wahhabism took wings uh, even inside Afghanistan. And uh, regrettably, you know, yes, we saw that uh, play out in the 1990s as well, when the more moderate elements were removed and the Wahhabi elements uh, were spearheaded by the Taliban came to power in 1996 under the patronage of Bill Clinton, then President of the United States. Well, uh, I, I, they, they ran the uh, Afghanistan in 2001. Uh, I mean, you know, 9-11 happened because of Bill Clinton's mistake in allowing the Taliban to take control of Afghanistan. Clinton is, in a sense, responsible ultimately for 9-11. Although nobody really understands that. 9-11 did not come out of, I mean, you know, the Taliban did not suddenly become a, a, a terror force. The Taliban did not suddenly become a nurturer and breeding ground of terrorists. It was always that. And there's Americans who, who made it that. Well, what happened after 2001? In 2001, the Northern Alliance, supported by India, Iran, and to some and, you know, to some extent, uh, if I may say so, by, by, by the Soviet Union. Uh, then, then, of course, Soviet Union collapsed in 92, so that collapsed. India and Iran remained in the battle and support Northern Alliance. And uh, as a consequence, what happened was they were able to hold on to a small part of Afghanistan. And subsequently, then the Americans also gave a massive support and reduced their support to the Wahhabis. Well, with 9-11, then what happened was that the Northern Alliance, with American support logistically, was able to quickly reconquer the country and relegate the Taliban to insignificance. Of course, then you have what happened in Kunduz, for example, in which the Pakistan military was able to exfiltrate hundreds of terrorists, hundreds of Pakistani and Afghan and, and European and Arab terrorists. I don't know why Bush allowed that to happen, but they allowed it to happen. And these hundreds of terrorists were brought to safety in Pakistan. And of course, you know what has happened. Mayhem uh, broke out once again in Afghanistan as a consequence of the uh, of these unfair decisions by George W. Bush. What is very interesting, you know, these these things you never hear in the history books. Uh, in, you will never you will never see that in the scholarly treatises because what happens is those who write that will not get any scholarship. They will not get any invitation to lecture in universities. Somehow I managed to get invitations, although of course I never accepted a scholarship. But the reality is the Taliban was funded by the United States. Yes. How did that happen, you know? It happened because the Pakistan army is to tell the Americans, oh, we have ex Afghan warlord who's a moderate, a real moderate. If you've gone to his house, you will see the person is women. He's not allowing children to, to study. He's not allowing girl children to study. He's not allowing boys to study. But these are the moderates who were given money. And the Americans said, OK, $2 million check, $3 million check. Half of that will go to the Pakistan uh, ISI and military. The generals will be happy. They could buy new homes in Miami or New York or Paris or London. And the, the warlords would be happy. And they're all Taliban warlords. So the Taliban came back to power with American money. This is a serial history of American mistakes in Afghanistan. Which So you have on the one hand American money. On the other hand, you've got the same money being used to kill Americans. And to, to create terror attacks on Europe and other countries. It's an amazing policy, and the good thing about the United States, they, they, they're, they're a bit like the Communist Party of China, the government in the United States. They never acknowledge their made mistake. They always justify what they've done, and they put some straight code and say, oh, somebody else did it. In China, for example, in Tibet, the Tibetan people are very unhappy. Oh, India's doing it. The Uyghurs are very unhappy. Oh, the Americans are doing it. Communist Party is innocent. Communist Party is wonderful. It's only India and Tibet 
and uh, America and Xinjiang that's causing the problem. So this is the history of Afghanistan. I'd like to say that Donald Trump, I mean, I have to have some regard to Trump. I predicted his victory way back in 2015. I have written articles about it, so it's on record. This is a predicting victory of Biden and Kamala Harris uh, in, you know, in 2020, well before they were elected. Uh, well, the reality of the situation is that, uh, you know, it is a big mistake, frankly, to go in for this Doha process. And in this Doha process, the Afghan government was ignored, the Taliban was empowered, and that was the beginning of the process by which the Taliban were again incentivized, funded from these sources. It will be very easy to identify which sources are funded the Taliban. In my opinion, they should be identified, they should be proscribed, they should be prosecuted, but nothing is happening to them for some odd reason. I don't know why. The Americans, the Europeans, the Brits, they're doing nothing about it. So the reality is that this was a huge mistake. And I can tell you, the Taliban coming to power in Kabul in any form, it will be like Hitler coming to power in 1933 in Germany. Hitler came to power as the Chancellor of Germany. He had only three Nazi ministers out of an entire cabinet. You had von Papen, the vice, the vice chancellor, and yes. various other ministers. In a matter of about one and a half years, they were reduced to zero. It became a pure new Nazi government. In a matter of less than one year, I tell you, the government in which the Taliban is a part will become a Talibanized government. It will be a bad news not only for India, for Europe, for the United States, for all these different countries. But the good news is the people of Afghanistan will fight the Taliban. The Pashtun community will fight the Taliban. And Getting the Taliban in power in Kabul will spell the meltdown of Pakistan because the Pashtun community in Pakistan will finally rally to their Pashtun brothers and sisters who have been left by this ethnic, I mean, frankly, the Pakistan military is a Punjabi military. There's no, there's no Sindhi element effectively in control. There's no Baloch, there's no Pashtun. Ramkevaste Pashtun uh, is there, but otherwise no Pashtun. It's entirely dominated by a few se segments of the uh, uh, Punjabi Pakistani. And they are ruling like colonial masters over the other ethnicities of Pakistan. The Pashtun will rise. They will rise in Afghanistan, they will rise in Pakistan, they will come together. And that will also be the meltdown of Pakistan. So I'd like to say, the fact is, the Taliban, a civil war is going on. This civil war is being fought by China and by Pakistan. I think Joe Biden finally is beginning to understand that he made a huge mistake following in the footsteps of Donald Trump. So I don't think that mistake is going to continue. But China and Pakistan are going to work to try and strengthen the Taliban and other countries have to defeat that because the Taliban is bad news. It's a civil war and the civil war has got to be won by the modern, moderate of caste and especially, especially the modern, moderate majority of Pashtuns. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Um, that's the complete scenario uh, in a nutshell. Uh, but as you said, the civil war looks like a possibility and given the possibility of civil war and you know uh, possible fragmentation on one side on one hand and the efforts like uh, heart of asia then the heart of asia istanbul process uh, which happened earlier this year again uh, the promise that heart of asia will uh, discuss about ways to bring peace in afghanistan so on one hand we have forces like pakistan which will obviously benefit from a fragmented uh, Afghanistan and Sri Lanka in Afghanistan. On the other hand, we have Heart of Asia process where uh, India could be involved in a major way in the coming days. So, how do these two come together, uh, Professor? I mean, which will take us, uh, uh, you know, upper hand? Uh, we hope that the peace process uh, continues and there's peace in Afghanistan and Indian interests are safeguarded. But uh, these two different efforts, uh, so how? 
Uh, how do you see that, uh, Professor? You see, Prashant, there's a, there's a chap called Sri Northcote Parkinson who wrote a book called Parkinson's Law. And Parkinson's Law is that work expands to fill the time available in its completion. So let's say you have got uh, you know, 10 people working in Samvada. They're working very, very hard. Now you say, okay, somebody comes in and says, okay, I will, you know, I think Samvada is doing a great job. I'll fund you enough so you can have 25 people. So you recruit 15 more. So you believe that everybody will get less work. The 10 people will work very hard, even harder than before. And the other 15 will also work hard because the work will expand. Everybody will make work for each other. Many of the diplomats in the world essentially make work for each other. You know, Ashare said that you go round and round and round and round the room and you land up finally always in the same place <laughs> that you started from a few seconds or minutes ago. But still you go round and round the room and you believe you're making progress. Let me tell you, all these so-called peace processes, if Acharya and Ranish were here, and there are some, some points of scholarship that I agree with him, others that I don't, it is a, frankly, you cannot bring the Taliban together with the Afghan national government. They are antithetical to each other. It is not possible. And any such peace process is an exercise. Afghanistan is in a civil war. We have to recognize that reality. And I'm happy to say Prime Minister Modi is certainly doing that. I think that they're going to SCO, they're going to all these things. But the reality is, uh, Foreign Minister Jay Shankar has just met Abdullah Abdullah, an outstanding yes. state person, a moderate of Khan, a great leader. And he met, uh, a, 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 you know, a, even with the top uh, the top person in the government of Afghanistan. He met him in Tashkent, President uh, Ghani. And, uh, you know, when he made it very clear, we support the Afghan government. You cannot support the Afghan government and people who want to slit the throats of the people in the Afghan government at the same time. It, you know, unless you're a schizophrenic, and if you're a schizophrenic, you should get medical treatment. You should not be involved in imaginary peace processes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, corollary to this issue, what's happening in Afghanistan, is a factor which I personally think uh, India is discussing more. But if I see the world media, uh, the factor of China, it's not being considered much. I mean, its interests and the way it is helping Taliban, or, uh, you know, its nefarious uh, activities within Afghanistan, this is a fact which is not covered much in the Western media. So, when I talk about this factor, Professor, like, uh, what are the interests of China in Pakistan, uh, sorry, in Afghanistan, and how are they dealing with Taliban? And this is the first part. The second part is, given a scenario where, uh, you know, uh, Taliban gets the upper hand uh, and China supports it, what will happen to Indian interests and how will India, how can India deal with uh, Afghanistan in such a scenario, Professor? With China also yeah, first of all, I'd like to say there is no doubt the Chinese want the Taliban to come to power. They are with the Pakistan military and Pakistan military is with the Taliban. Recently, the Chinese announced an ambassador to the Taliban. Now, let us say in Delhi, the Chinese have announced an, uh, okay, they have an ambassador, who is ambassador to the government of India. This is a BJP government. So now we are, the Chinese are going to appoint another ambassador, ambassador to the opposition. You know, uh, I mean, they, they can say, all right, the largest party is Congress. So ambassador to the, the, the opposition represented by the president of the Congress party. Let's say they do that. How are we going to react? The government is going to throw the existing ambassador out and not allow this uh, so-called ambassador to the opposition to land anywhere in India. Am I right? So, but yes. the Chinese have announced an ambassador to Taliban. So, I don't see why there is any doubt about whom the Chinese are supporting in mm -hmm. Afghanistan. They are supporting the Taliban. Uh, so, as far as India is concerned, 
Well, I think India is uh, understand the ground situation. Certainly, I'm sure Prime Minister Modi does, and I'm I'm sure External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar does, and both are given every indication of that in their meetings that they do understand the situation. So let's be honest. There is, you know, uh, the Taliban cannot really control the ground in Afghanistan. They may be able to take over some areas, including possibly worst-case scenario Kabul. But that is if the Americans continue to make a large number of mistakes. And I think, from my assessment is, I had said that publicly a few weeks ago that Biden seems to be understanding that he's on a close to disaster, and the recent U.S. activity in support of Afghan government, the same Anthony Blinken who sent a nasty letter to the Afghan government. At least 50% of ministerial jobs must be reserved for Taliban. I'm glad that none of Anthony Lincoln's children is studying in any location where the Taliban have taken over. Uh, I'm glad that and the, the Blinken family is nowhere near where the Taliban is. So I can assure you, the Blinken family, nobody would, would insure them for any kind of life insurance uh, if that were the case. But these are the people who Blinken is Secretary of State. Oh, you must give fifty percent of the of your the cabinet you must resign for Taliban. That same Blinken appears to be a little more rational now. He's coming to Delhi and he has not repeated that absurd statement for this. So I think that the world is beginning to understand what the Taliban is. It's the same as what the Taliban was and will always will be. And so far as China is concerned, please understand this. Now. The more there are terror attacks in the Western world, forget India, the more there are terror attacks in Europe, the better for China. Why? It's called a diversionary tactic. Where if you remember back, uh, you know, in 9-11, the 9-11 happened, George W. Bush actually was focusing on China. He was focusing very much on China. Suddenly we had 9-11. He was focusing on Wahhabi terrorism. Entire focus went away from China. So the Chinese desperately uh, Communist Party would be, then if, should there be a recurrence of terrorism in Afghanistan, which they know and we know is certain if the Taliban comes to power, then why are they backing the Taliban? Because that will then enable the spotlight to go away from them away from their activities, the way it went in 2001. Yes. yes that is why the, 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 the Chinese are hand in glove with the Wahhabi International. The Wahhabi International is their best friend. They work together with the Wahhabi International. Because the Wahhabi International is the diversion. It's what I would call the lizard's tail. It's the tail of the lizard. So what happens? The cat goes after the tail and the lizard is <laughs> True, true. So, yes, and, and that's pretty clear uh, about the China's interest. Now, uh, extended uh, timeline, in extended timeline, we see, like, uh, we, we, uh, we read reports about US asking for, uh, you know, a staging basis in uh, Central Asian Republics. And uh, when, uh, as far as I know, uh, none of them have agreed. And uh, on the other hand, China is building very close relations with the car countries. Now, uh, Central Asia is also important to India in terms of uh, resources, uh, I mean, uh, uh, future ties. Now, uh, it, it seems like it's good that the uh, US still has some staging base somewhere close to Afghanistan. But on the other hand, China is trying to impress on the uh, Central Asian Republics. So in this extended scenario, uh, how will these things play out? Uh, India trying to, you know, uh, in the, India is kind of a late entrant into the, you know, relations with uh, Central Asian countries and China has an early more advantage. And US, uh, I mean, I don't know, it's still asking for staging basis. So how will this scenario play out, uh, Professor? And uh, how should India deal in such a scenario with the Central Asian republics? Prashant. 
Let me tell you that unfortunately old habits have a linger on and linger on and linger on. You remember the so-called G4 as in India, Germany, Brazil, Japan, and yes, if, if you know all of us will together enter the UN Security Council and not any one of us. Frankly, that was a silly idea from the UPA period for a simple reason that in Latin America, Brazil is not popular. Japan is certainly going to be vetoed by China no matter what. They may finally ag agree to India, but never Japan. And as for Germany, you've got France and Britain there, two European countries. You've got, uh, and then you want a third European country in the Security Council. I mean, it's, it's not a very large continent. You know, if you want three European countries, it makes no sense. You already have France and Britain, then you have Germany. Well, then let's have Poland also. Why not Poland? Poland is a fascinating country. So, frankly, that was a very foolish act about diplomats. As I told you, international diplomacy today is about meetings, conferences, you know, uh, photo opportunities, media opportunities, declarations. Biden and uh, Boris Johnson signed the new Atlantic Charter. Very frankly, you know, the, I mean, Mark says that history repeats tragedy as past. Well, the Atlantic Charter was not tragedy. It was a great hope for the world. But this is past. The new Atlantic Charter is past. What is needed is an Indo-Pacific Charter. Now, India, let me say, the problem with, with India, you know, we say the institution of marriage. At the same time, we are saying, all right, we'll have a living relationship with Russia. We'll have a living relationship with America. We'll have a flirtation with China. We won't end that flirtation. And if Pakistan starts, you know, making some beauty at us, we may look occasionally at Pakistan. We may visit them for lunch or dinner. Or we may not do anything more. But we, no, frankly, it doesn't work that way. We are still sitting on the wall uh, of so-called balance between powers when the whole world is separating with Cold War 2.0. Cold War 1.0 between the United States and Soviet Union. The Chinese understood that. They grabbed the advantage of that. And today I can tell you, the Chinese economy was smaller than the Indian economy when Deng Xiaoping took charge in 1979. Today it is five times larger. Five times larger. Because they took advantage of Cold War 1.0. Today it's Cold War 2.0 between the US and China. And this country can be what is called in Latin the tertius coordinates. The who, that is, the, 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 the tertius coordinates is. The third party who gets the gold, India can get the gold. If we are clear on the side of this Cold War 2.0, the way the Chinese were, we will get the gold of investment flowing from China to other countries. Why would they invest in India? They are leaving China because they don't want anything to do with China. On the other hand, you want them to come to a country which is the best friends of the Chinese ally, Russia, and it is still talking about some kind of a process with China, boundary process, this process. I mean, Xi Jinping just yesterday visited Tibet and made some nasty statements, but you still find people in Ukraine telling, no, 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 actually, we're just talking, he doesn't mean uh, harm. Well, we would have heard Nehru and Kishman believe that. I know, I'm sure Modi does not believe that. I have faith in Modi. The fact is, this is a golden opportunity for India. Okay. And this opportunity we should grab. Forget being on the fence. We are on the side that is wanting to prevent China and its ally Russia and its ally the Wahhabis from taking control of the indo pacific Let's be clear on that. And let's not waffle. No, no, we are neither here, we are not there. You know, we will we will go in for living here, living there. For God's sake, you know, 1971, DP Dhar ensured the 1971 Indo-Soviet Treaty. 
At that time, the foreign office mandarin were all saying, no, 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 this is not one alignment. BP that told Indira Gandhi, you want to go in and save the Bengalis, the Chinese will be at our throats. The only way to stop them is to have this treaty with the Soviet Union. Indira Gandhi said, yes, have that treaty. Today I can tell you, Prashant, the only way for us to get back Gilgit Pakistan, to get back POK, and we can do it, is to ensure that there is a treaty with the United States and other democracies to ensure that China will not intervene. Because we, China should not intervene. And the only way to prevent that is to do what Indira Gandhi did in 1971. This time, not with the Soviet Union, but with another power, but still in our country, people don't understand the realities of geopolitics, the cold-blooded nature of what is needed to ensure that a country comes up so when we allow sentiment and when we allow the past to override reason and the fact that we are in the 21st century, the 21st century realities. And if we lose this opportunity for some, well, I don't know when we'll get another. Maybe when you are a grandfather, uh, in, during the time when your children become adults, that opportunity will come. Thank you. That was very hard hitting, Professor. And I'm sure that will be a culture shock for many who will hear this. <laughs> because uh, you bought in Russia, and my um, next question was related to that. Uh, it, you, uh, you know, bluntly told that uh, Russia is the ally of China, and uh, uh, certainly uh, we should look towards the West, the US, rather than Russia. So, my next question was related to that. Like, the Russia-led, uh, you know, comprehensive treaty and all that, and India having defense ties with Russia. So, uh, I mean, how does India balance this? I mean, is there a necessity? As you said, I mean, we uh, we we don't consider Russia as a major partner instead of consider US. And and specifically, what is the interest of Russia in Afghanistan, and how does India deal with Russia? Ties with China. Let me say yeah. that I am not suggesting that you become like another Japan or Germany or, or UK or France with America. No way. India is India. For example, I, I was always against the fact that the government of India stopped oil purchases from Iraq under pressure from Donald Trump. Yes. The Iran is very important for us. And friendship with Iran is very important. It was a mistake to stop those oil purchases. And we have weakened our position in Chabahar to the benefit of the Chinese and the Pakistanis significantly because of that. So wherever the Americans are wrong, tell them you're wrong, they're not going to follow. But wherever they are right, and we are on the same page, we go with that page. I'm not saying that we should be a camp follower. I'm not saying that we should be like Japan and do whatever they ask us to do. We should. We are India, and India has its own mind and its own interests. And may I say, to the Americans, I mean, my American friends also, if, you know, including some people who are very hostile to Iran. I am I, I, very friendly with them. Remember, I organized the first India-Israel-US joint conference in 2003 in the, through opposition from Vajpayee government who said no, 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 then, you know, if you do this, Muslims all over the world will get angry. They will say that the Jews, Hindus and Christians are coming together. I said nonsense. No Muslim is going to get angry. Nothing is going to happen. So we went ahead, organized the conference. Well, the government you know, removed all the official meetings. So President Abdul Kalam, Deputy Prime Minister Adwani, uh, uh, then, if I may say so, Defense Minister George Fernandez, the PC Fund, uh, the Planning Commission Deputy Chairperson, all of them met the delegation in their personal capacity, many in their houses. Abdul Kalam, the President of India, met in Rashtrapati Bhavan. It was MD Nalapar plus 9, or MD Nalapar plus 11, or plus 12. Adwani ji had the courage to say, nothing doing. These are friends of ours. These are not enemies. I will meet them. And even if, 
this sort of government meeting it is not about trust so and so and he, all of them met and the conference went on i had explained to them why iran is important well i think i am still welcome in america i am still welcome uh, among for example my jewish friends uh, i have been friendly with them for a long time i have been friendly with with the, with my arab friends for a long time and both sides still welcome me why is it that for example a few days ago cdp invited me for a live show and is china global television network in spite of my very strong criticism of china because prashant what i'm telling you now is what i told them in my visit to beijing in a more polite way i'm not telling you one thing and telling them one thing i'm not telling americans one thing and telling you something else i'm telling the american what i'm telling you i'm telling the chinese what i'm telling you and which is why even today CDTN invites me, you know, yeah. uh, a yeah. they don't invite me for a trip thing, they invite me live, three or four days ago on dialogue, I was invited live for Wong Yi's visit, and you know what I've been saying about China, why do I say the same thing to them, so yeah. I want to say one thing, I'm not saying to be a fool of America like Tony Blair, I'm yeah. simply saying, understand, China is hostile to you, Yes. China will definitely try and hold you back. This is your opportunity. When the United States and the other countries are moving technology from China, yes. when a uh, trillion dollars of, of investment can flow outside China, that is the time for us to get at least 300, 400 billion of those dollars and give jobs to our own people. This is our cost. And people say, oh, this, you know, I, I want to I want to be a small, it's actually humorous. And the humorous thing is, in this government, some people in the intelligence services gave a very nice long report about me about six years ago. That oh my god, we'll be careful about this guy. He is actually a Chinese agent. The same fellow wrote a report about me about one year ago. Oh my God, be careful about this guy. He's an American agent. You know, for sure, I'm, you know, if I'm an agent of anybody, it's an agent of my wife, next me. And I think no Malayalis, I mean, all men should be agents of their wives. We are grateful to them for being in our lives. We love them and we are happy that they love us. They will be foolish enough to love us. So if I'm an agent of anybody, it's an agent of next me, by. You know, whoever is not the next me by the twelfth person to carry it. One is that, and we are surely agent of India. And <laughs> yeah, but, I, I, I love my country, Prashant. I love our country. I never surrender my passport. I've been offered at least three, four different citizenships. I always say thank you. But the excuse I gave was I can't cook, I can't drive. I don't do laundry. What am I going to do? I, I can't type. What am I going to do? Here, you know, living in your country. But that's only an excuse. I cannot leave my country. I love my country. And that's why I want to see this country grow and not make mistakes. I'm not going to run away to some other country. I'm going to remain here. And I'd like to convert the hell in which hundreds of millions of Indians still are, despite the best efforts of Prime Minister Modi. Into yes. something resembling a good decent life. I, I understand, Professor. And just one last question uh, related to the subject, Professor. Uh, you, know, you gave the message that India has to stand on its own and take its own decisions. So, uh, so do you see a scenario where India has to increase its military presence in Afghanistan to protect its interest? And in, if that happens, is there a, a possibility of you know uh, you know uh, altercation with China, military altercation with China? Uh, and and in your opinion, uh, whatever the scenario, do you think India should increase its troop presence? Well, one thing I will tell you, I am very glad Joe Biden had the sense to remove American troops from Afghanistan. Wherever American troops are gone in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, in Afghanistan. Or, or NATO troops have gone, they have created mayhem, absolute mayhem. 
So yes. uh, I'm very happy as all of the full group of all. I salute uh, Biden for that decision. I salute NATO for that decision. But at the same time, what is needed is to do what they did in the case of the Northern Alliance. Give them air support, give them logistical support, give them uh, data support. And that should be done. You cannot abandon them to the, to the terrorist forces. So remove your troops. And India, no way. I don't want a single Indian soldier fighting on behalf of Afghanistan. No. The Afghans are perfectly capable of fighting on their own. And they're not going to like anybody else, even their good friends India, fighting in their country. They're not going to like it. No. Let us train the Afghan soldiers. Some of them may be trained in, in Afghanistan. Some may be trained uh, in, in India. The training given by NATO is not only zero, worse than zero. It equips them for the wrong war in the wrong country at the wrong time. That is, and they have to unlearn all that the Americans and the Germans and the French and the British and the Italians and God knows who else, the Dutch and the Belgians taught them. They got to unlearn all that before they become good. Uh, again at fighting but we our training is good why because we are the one country where a jihadi force a wahhabi force was beaten back and that is in kashmir i used to visit kashmir in the 1990s and i'm sorry to say the bjp has also made some mistakes like the alliance with the pdp from day one i said it's a disaster how are you aligning with these people Finally, they woke up, and whatever progress has happened in Kashmir has come after the breakup of the PDP. We should continue with Article 370 being abolished. We should continue with Jammu, with Ladakh, and with uh, with 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 uh, with uh, Kashmir. Actually, now the people of Jammu and the people of Ladakh, even from uh, what, what they were suffering all these decades, which was controlled by a small minority of people and who took 90% of the resources that the central lavish from them. So I'm saying very clearly that I am very, very clear that we should not send troops to Afghanistan. We should send trainers to Afghanistan. Yes. And yes. we have to start troops coming to India to train. They are brave enough to fight their own war. All that is needed to fight this evil force, including Pakistanis there, is how they have guns themselves. But we should train them. The Americans should give them logistical help, equipment, etc. Data help, you know, air support. We, and we give the training, Americans give air support, logistics, Europeans and Japanese provide the money. It's a perfect amalgam. The troops, only Afghan troops. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Professor Ryan. All yes. of you, yes. I, I respect yes. Samadha a lot, and I, I respect you for the hard work and sincerity you're showing. So, all I can say, Jai uh, Thank you, Jai Hind, Professor, and a lot of new learnings, a lot of new takeaways about the scenario. Uh, some things which we just read from reports, you have explained it in detail. I thank you once again, Professor. And I, I wish uh, you made some time to talk to us again sometime uh, based on the developing scenario. Very definitely, it will be an honor. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Professor.